Good evening, my name is Eric Kane, and I'm serving as moderator tonight uh, for this uh, uh, important discussion about an overview of biopsychosocial bio innovations in care that's being presented as part of the 75th anniversary webinar series for the Department of Psychiatry. It's really a pleasure to be able to bring together a group of outstanding colleagues to talk about the programs that they've set up to deal with the unique populations that uh, really are the focus of their attention and serve as an extension of the biopsychosocial model from a focus on individuals to a focus on populations and diverse groups people who have some collective commonality, even as we try to reach out and um, define and understand the needs of a person and the family, but also how these folks come from particular communities. And I mean community, not only spatially, but people with collective commonalities and how this is really taking the biopsychosocial model farther than it was even in its inception. And I wanna review a bit about, you know, sort of how George Engel came to this. We've heard about George and John Romano and, and the like, but it's interesting to think about the pieces and somewhat how they were assembled. You know, George was first influenced um, by Adolf Meyer, who was his professor at Johns Hopkins in the 1930s when he was a medical student. And if we think of George as a synthesizer and integrator, then it's really the influence of people like Meyer and others who I'll chat about um, that really bring the special quality of, of what he developed. So Meyer talked about life story and he talked about reactions. And in fact, DSM one and two, the diagnostic, diagnostic and statistical manual were really about reactions um, as they were called a you know, psychotic reaction, a neurotic reaction, a depressive reaction. In 1940, George went from where he had been doing an internship in New York City at Mount Sinai to the Peter Van Brigham Hospital in Boston, and that's where he met John Romano. And from John, there were several very important influences. One was a Romano's interest in what he called human biology. A second was the really remarkable thing that John did and actually published in JAMA in 1942, which is a clinical case conference in front of trainees where they talked about the person's life and what was happening to the individual. And this was not psychiatry, this was on the medicine floors and the medicine rounds because Romano was one of the six attendings there and with his background in psychiatry and neurology and medicine, he took on a full role under the direction of someone named Soma Weiss at the Brigham. Um, Romano also encouraged George to begin to use the electroencephalograph which had been developed in the late 1920s to study uh, physiology. And they went to Cincinnati together. And um, in talking to George many years later, one of the questions I had was, how did he really begin to get to his interest and focus on the individual? And he spoke about his work with Romano and particularly how during World War II, people would pass out um, when they went into hypobaric chambers as, they were studying you know, what happened to pilots at high altitudes. And some people passed out at the equivalent of 20 or 25,000 feet, but other people went to 30,000 feet. And he became intrigued. And what was it that re related between these people and their physical manifestations of becoming comatose, delirious, which is some of the early work they did on delirium and the EEG presentations, but ultimately passed out. And in the late 40s, George um, undertook psychoanalysis, which he really thought was a very exciting thing to do at the time. And again, this focused on the individual, but, it, but in a way amplified what Meyer was talking about, Adolf Meyer, in terms of early life experience affecting one's psychology. And it was really this action in the 1950s that George undertook to integrate thinking about psychology and thinking about physiology that began to be the hallmark of his work and certainly his writings during the 1950s um, were very characteristic of this and this integration as opposed to dualism. And that's one of the key themes of the biopsychosocial model that he wrote about in 1977. And in the 1960s, he started to really look at systems theory, which was very popular at that time not only in Rochester, but even 90 miles away in Ithaca, New York, where Yuri Bronfenbrenner was using systems theory in other ways. Um, so this was a you know, scientific approach to look at the interconnectedness again 
of things that people had separated. And George re rejected the dualism that was so evident in psychiatry at that time and you know how it had been carried on, but also in medicine. And he said this dualism and the reductionism is not acceptable. Now, the term biopsychosocial was first used in the 1950s by someone named Roy Grinker. George wrote his article in 1977, didn't actually pick up the term. He told me in the mid 1980s that actually it was the secretary of Philip Abelson, um, who was the copy editor at, at Science, who suggested he use the term. And he brought that term to bear. Again, as we see in papers in the American Journal of Psychiatry and in the New England Journal of Medicine, when he was talking about education in 1982, to focus on the person. But the work we're gonna to hear today is not only focusing on the person, but focusing on groups of people that have unique needs and how this emphasis on groups and service innovation and clinical care innovation is integrated with what was the biopsychosocial model. So I'm gonna stop now and introduce this brief film. Now, we welcome questions and please put them in the question and answer section uh, here and you can either address them to the group generally or to individuals. Um, we're gonna do some broad thematic questions first and then we'll get to individual questions that you submit. And uh, we're gonna have a sort of rapid fire film with our different presenters um, for 32 minutes. And then after that, we're gonna come back to the thematic questions and then um, your questions that you submit. So welcome, it's great to have you here. It's great to think about how these very creative people have taken the principles and the spirit of the biopsychosocial model and used them to build new programs, new clinical services that then are used to meet the needs of individuals as well as their families and their communities. With that, I'm going to step aside, turn off my video and we'll turn on the video uh, presentation. Our history of helping people with serious mental illness really dates back to Dr. John Romano, our first chair. He reached out to the state hospital and developed one of the first public academic liaisons in the country because at the time, most people with serious mental illness were cared for in state hospitals. But here at the University of Rochester, things changed starting with John Romano. That public academic liaison started to expose residents to care of people with serious mental illness. And then a major innovation happened in the 1980s, the Monroe Livingston Demonstration Project. Across the United States, when state hospitals were closing down and people with mental illness were coming into communities that were not prepared for them, here in Rochester, under the Monroe Livingston Project, Money flowed with people coming out of the state hospital into our community. And that built Strong Ties Community Support Program in 1988. When Strong Ties opened up, we thought that everybody coming out of the state hospital would go there, but we found soon enough that some of them never made it to our shiny new clinic. Many were becoming arrested and incarcerated in Monroe County Jail but we built the first assertive community treatment team to get out of the walls of our clinic, to go into the community and to do inreach into the jail. And we eventually were able to connect with people that had difficulty connecting with traditional mental health services. And by engaging them, we also engaged their probation officers, their parole officers, judges that were working with them, because most of them were heavily involved in the criminal justice system. We found that by working with criminal justice professionals, we were able to do shared problem solving. We were able to consider therapeutic alternatives to incarceration. And we started to develop a new model of care, which has been called Forensic Assertive Community Treatment, or FACT. Project Link was our first FACT team. It was our prototype. And in 1999, it won the American Psychiatric Association's Gold Award for Innovation. So we received funding from the National Institute of Mental Health to develop a standardized FACT program and to do randomized control testing. So we were able to show that by partnering with the criminal justice system in certain ways, we were able to significantly reduce 
convictions for new crimes, days spent in jail, days spent in the hospital, and we're able to improve engagement in outpatient services. As we started to develop our model, we started to get requests from other communities to do something very similar or to help them with programs they'd already established. So in our division, we've really had an emphasis on developing evidence-based practices. One was our Forensic Act program, but another one is family services. You know, we've learned that in the community, families are often the primary caretakers of people with serious mental illness, and families often don't know how to help their loved ones. So we developed the Family Institute for Education, Research, and Practice. And for 25 years, this program provided training and education in evidence-based approaches to families. So we started with the family psychoeducation model, later developed a spectrum model, after that developed consumer-centered family psychoeducation, and these were all variations on the theme of how do you help families help their loved ones with mental illness. So following the biopsychosocial model, our community division has been able to attend to the psychological needs of our patients through evidence-based mental health services. We've been able to attend to the biological needs through integration of primary medical care and pharmacy services. And last but not least, we've been able to attend to the social needs of our patients by engaging their families and by engaging the communities in which they live. Strong Recovery is an outpatient program for substance use disorder treatment. I came to Strong Recovery in 1992 uh, and accepted the medical director position and Dr. Klein was asked to start the program in the mid 80s. Uh, at that time the methadone treatment program was already in existence. It had started in 1973. He did several uh, very interesting integrative things. Um, initially, he started the substance use disorder treatment program uh, as a freestanding program, not connected to the methadone program. Uh, but then later on in subsequent years, he helped merge the two programs together. Um, another very important thing that he did was to negotiate that our patients who were receiving methadone for opioid use disorder were able to reside in local halfway houses. We've always had a wonderful network of local halfway houses and initially, um, you know, of course, methadone was not allowed in these halfway houses. And it's very important for people to continue taking their methadone because methadone is um, a very important medication for treatment of opioid use disorder. So one of the things I'm most proud of uh, with the Strong Recovery Program is that we've offered treatment for psychiatric conditions from the beginning. Uh, we were able to help people continue their psychiatric medications. Often when people are using drugs, they stop taking their medicines for whatever reason, they run out, uh, uh, and they uh, burn their bridges with uh, whoever was prescribing it for them. So we're able to pick this up and uh, help them get to a, a stable point as far as mental health symptoms go. Another one of the very important things that we have done at Strong Recovery is that we have been uh, very quick to adopt uh, new drugs uh, that are allowed. Uh, we've actually uh, been able to offer every uh, medication approved for uh, treatment of substance use disorder uh, by the FDA. Not only uh, the medication involved, the medication is very important, but uh, the other parts of care are also important, uh, including the work that counselors do to retain people in care and engage them in treatment. Um, that's a very important thing uh, that counselors are often very good at. Uh, and um, we try to look at the whole part of the person and, and meet them where they're at. So they may need housing first, they may need vocational help first. Um, and then later on, they may accept medications for substance use disorder treatment. 
I'm going to highlight three innovations that really embodies the biopsychosocial model in our substance use disorder treatment programs. Um, the first one is um, TOPS, which is transforming outpatient services. The second one is the implementation of CCBHC, which is the Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic. And the third is the SUDPC, which is Substance Use Disorder in Primary Care. As Dr. Bashevitz mentioned earlier, um, our methadone maintenance clinic and our chemical dependency outpatient clinics um, started merging and really functioning under the unified name of Strong Recovery. And what that did was offer all of the services and all of the resources we had in these two clinics to our patients. So the process became really seamless. Patients received one biopsychosocial intake assessment and we were able to identify what their needs are. And it really did not matter which clinic they were registered in. They had the benefit of all of the medications we offer, all of the um, treatment and behavioral services that we offer under one roof. In 2016, we actually moved from um, the Stromoy Hospital building to West Henrietta Road, where the physical space of the program was designed to function as one comprehensive program. And the second innovation that followed is the implementation of the CCBHC. CCBHC is, stands for Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic. What the CCBHC offered was the ability to offer substance use disorder treatment, mental health treatment, integrating primary care screening and monitoring and um, other aspects of care, which to me are some of the social aspects of care. Um, we offer targeted case management, which really connected people with if housing is their need, clothing, food insecurities, any of those needs are met through our targeted case management services. And we also implemented offering psychosocial rehab services, which really for our patient population focuses on vocational and educational needs. So by implementing the CCBHC, we're really able to embody the biopsychosocial model because we are, we are treating the whole person and the patient around summer of 2021, um, we implemented what's called the SUDPC. SUDPC is Substance Use Disorder Dash Primary Care. And the focus of that program is to integrate substance use disorder treatment in our primary care practices in the UR medicine system. So that team has the ability to, whether through telehealth or directly going to the primary care practices to assess patients, determine what their treatment needs are, then we connect them to the appropriate care. That team also has the ability to provide some supportive treatment for patients that the primary care providers are, are treating. So if we have primary care providers who are prescribing um, buprenorphine to patients, for example, then the SUDPC team provides the counseling support and, and any other need the patient might need, connecting them to um, a peer support specialist who might help them connect to um, recovery activities in, in the community where the patient lives. Um, those three programs really, um, really built on that foundation that was set by Dr. Klein and Dr. Bashevitz. Psychiatric nursing and psychiatric nursing staff are the largest workforce in the Department of Psychiatry. That's largely driven by the fact that psychiatric nurses staff our acute services, such as our inpatient units and the psychiatric emergency room, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, so their face-to-face -face time with patients is also uh, a quite extended amount of time. We also have 65 
to 70 now advanced practice psychiatric nurses who function in every clinical service that we have in our department. But today I'm going to talk about two particular innovations where psychiatric registered nurses who primarily worked in acute services in 24-7 settings are now functioning in our outpatient clinical settings adding psychiatric nursing perspective to the care of highly vulnerable patient populations. The services in our CCBHC include our Strong Ties Clinic, our Strong Recovery Clinic, and the Pediatric Behavioral Health and Wellness Clinic for children. The services in each of these clinics involve integrated behavioral health and substance use treatment, as well as primary care screening and monitoring and interventions, um, which are uh, performed by the RNs. It also includes targeted case management, psychosocial rehab, peer specialists. So it's a really comprehensive program across our three clinics that are part of this national demonstration model. We're in year five. Another innovative program that I just want to speak to briefly is our nursing home, our skilled nursing facility telepsychiatry program. This is actually a program that's funded by the Office of Mental Health at the state level in order to provide clinical services, telepsychiatry, and nurse engagement specialist services to skilled nursing facilities across the entire New York State. What's different is that while the providers, which include psychiatrists, residents, and psychiatric nurse practitioners, provide consultation directly to the clients, the nurse engagement specialists on the team actually works with the nursing staff in the nursing homes in order to really ensure that um, the nursing staff are fully engaged in the care of vulnerable patients who are at risk for serious psychiatric disorders or have psychiatric disorders. They serve as resources for the um, RNs uh, in the nursing home. They provide on-site visits to the skilled nursing facilities in uh, the contract model for, and also can do it virtually um, through telepsychiatry. They do care plan development for patients with challenging behaviors. They partner with the nursing home staff to do that. They participate in unit rounds and case reviews. They review quality metrics data to identify patients that may need to be seen by the telepsychiatry consult service. They triage cases to telepsychiatry. At the same time, telepsychiatry providers may triage cases to the psych nurse engagement specialist because more nursing engagement at the skilled nursing facility needs to occur. So together as a team with, the other, with their interdisciplinary colleagues, the psychiatric mental health registered nurses are able to fully engage the entire scope of their discipline practice to effect a true biopsychosocial model of care for outpatients that is meant to be preventative and proactive to prevent acute exacerbations of either their psychiatric illness or their physical illness. We're very proud. Medicine and Psychiatry Services, or MIPS, were created back in 1994 with Dr. Boulay. Dr. Boulay really laid down the, uh, the ground for developing a primary care practice for those with severe mental illness who seem to be more vulnerable in falling through the cracks of the regular primary care office. Um, in 1995, when I was a med psych resident, Dr. Boulay invited me to have my continuity clinic be at uh, MIPS with him, and it was very grassroots. Uh, since then, we've grown uh, incredibly in size from one room. Now we have 10 exam rooms. We have an office space of 7,000 square feet. Uh, we have about uh, 14 employees, and we take care of the lives of about 1,600 people with severe mental illness. Uh, medicine and psychiatry services is unique as this, it is explicitly a primary care practice specializing in the needs of people with severe mental illness exclusively. It's really exciting to take care of this population. MIPS has grown to finally have an inpatient unit. Um, in 2007, we were given permission to open a 10-bed med psych unit, and we did so um, on the first floor of the R wing on the 192 space. Uh, two years later, 
Uh, the success of the unit was evident and we were asked to expand to 20 beds. So since 2010, we had been running 20 beds for people with severe mental illness who had acute medical problem. The MIPS unit now uh, termed IMIPS is strictly for people with severe mental illness but who are acutely medically ill. In other words, this is not a psychiatric unit, it's a medicine unit for people with psychiatric disorders. Um, last year, we were asked to expand once again, and we uh, expanded to a new unit in the same site called G92 or Summit. The Summit unit is organized in a way that it serves the medical needs of people with substance use disorder. It is the goal of this unit and the vision and mission of this unit to improve the health care of people with substance use disorder by providing them with um, compassionate care and understanding and by connecting them directly to services um, related to chemical dependency directly without a need to stop by and have another intake process. Summit also is very unique in that it has KSACs and peers working on the unit to engage patients in rehabilitation and abstinence. Um, the medical treatment of substance use disorder is aggressively addressed and the hopes is that patients will stay long enough to either um, connect with chemical dependency care or to um, at least finish and take care of their medical conditions to prevent morbidity and mortality related to their substance use disorder. Lazos Fuertes is Spanish for strong ties, and it really derived from the fact that the first uh, Lazos Fuertes office was actually inside Strong Ties facility. It was started in 1999, really largely due to my ex-chair, Dr. Kane, who facilitated my ability to pursue my dream to really take care of people Latinos with mental health issues in their own language and within a cultural framework. Um, Lazos Fuertes moved downtown in uh, early 2000 in the Ibero building where we began to grow and actually had a family marriage program there at the time, um, training many um, uh, family and marriage physician, uh, clinicians from outside of the country who were bilingual and bicultural. The innovative part about Lazos Fuertes is that you speak either language, Spanish or English, straight from the, from the time you open the door until you leave. The secretaries are bilingual, the nurses are bilingual, the uh, therapists are all bilingual. I am one of two bilingual psychiatrists in Rochester still and continue to provide the service. Uh, we've expanded to the point that we now have three full-time therapists. We have uh, a full-time uh, psychology postdoc. We have a part-time psychologist who does research on uh, suicide in Latino youth. And we currently have a um, Warren School of Education uh, counselor doing their internship at the Lasso's Clinic. To top that off, we also have two residents currently rotating through Lasso's, both bilingual in nature and who are running their continuity clinic at Lasso's. We continue to be the largest and the only bilingual bicultural clinic in upstate New York, and we continue to provide a much needed service for the community in Rochester. So I arrived for my job interview in the Department of Psychiatry. This was 1990. I'd been in the field for about five years at that time, but not in Rochester. And I had prepared the speech to talk to the uh, department chair to convince him that deaf mental health issues were important. So I get about two sentences into the speech, and the department chair stops me and says, Bob, we get it. This is Rochester. And I knew right away I was in the right place. And what he meant by that 
is that Rochester has the largest per capita deaf population in the world. At that time, nowhere in the medical center were there specialized services for deaf people who used sign language, but there were wonderful sign language interpreter services that were used throughout the hospital. When I was hired, I started serving deaf patients directly in sign language, of course, and an important goal for me was to establish a training program for people who were deaf and wanted to become mental health professionals, psychologists, social workers, etc. So I secured a grant from the National Institute of Mental Health in 1992, which launched what we call our program for deaf trainees. And the program expanded over time with funding from foundations and eventually from the Department of Psychiatry itself. To this day, probably the majority of psychologists who are deaf in the United States came through the Deaf Wellness Center at one point or another. Working with the deaf population truly is a biopsychosocial experience. There are medical issues that are relevant to the population far beyond hearing loss itself. There are linguistic issues, social experiences in the family and in the community deaf culture, relevant issues, resulting in a widely divergent population from persons who are extremely high functioning to persons who are extremely low functioning and everything in between. Since 1990, the Deaf Wellness Center has seen a growth in the number of deaf trainees we have served, the number of patients, of course, the number of deaf staff we have hired, deaf faculty who are now working within the medical center, and we've conducted a great deal of research, not only on psychological topics as they pertain to the deaf population, but research on sign language interpreting and public health issues as they pertain to the deaf population. Part of that effort included the founding of the National Center for Deaf Health Research here at the Medical Center, in which the Deaf Wellness Center was very heavily involved. We have created over a dozen films in American Sign Language, not only on psychological topics, but on topics pertaining to physical health as well. Because often, persons in the deaf population find it difficult to obtain information for a variety of reasons. And the importance of having deaf actors providing information about psychiatric, psychological, and medical topics in an accessible way to deaf audiences is something that the Deaf Wellness Center set as a priority from the very beginning. In closing, we are proud at the role that the Deaf Wellness Center has played locally, nationally, internationally in the fields of deaf mental health, sign language interpreting, and public health with the deaf population, and in what we've contributed to the training of deaf people who are now more and more present in the fields of psychiatry, social work, and related human service fields. I'm excited to tell you a little bit about some of the programs that we have going on in the Department of Psychiatry related to our youngest patients. Some people are confused by the idea of infant and early childhood mental health, but I think that's because most people use the words mental health, they are actually talking about mental illness, which doesn't fit our general thoughts about early childhood. But mental health is really the capacity to experience, express, and manage a full range of emotions form close and secure relationships with adults and peers, and explore the environment and learn. In young children, we sometimes feel more comfortable calling this socio-emotional health. Especially for young children, our clinical conceptualizations include information about development and biological risk and social determinants of health, which tend to be more family-focused risk factors but we also place a special importance on the role of environment and relationships with responsive, nurturing adults. In the Child and Adolescent Division, we see young children in almost all of our locations from our large mental health clinics at East River Road and South Ave to our integrated primary care and subspecialty clinics. And as director of IEC initiatives, I think about what our systems, supervisors, and clinicians need to provide the best care to families with young children as well as the kinds of services we want to be able to offer to our community in-house and through partnerships. One of our current projects is part of behavioral health integration at Golisano Children's Hospital Pediatric Practice, 
we started implementing Healthy Steps, a national model of integrated care that puts an early childhood specialist on the care team in order to address social and relational concerns early to improve health outcomes. This is part of a larger community-focused launch grant led by Children's Institute, focused on improving care, community collaborations, and cross-sector communications for children zero to eight and their families. The launch grant is in year three, and we are in the second year of Healthy Steps implementation. A second project, funded by the Mother Cabrini Health Foundation, has just gotten underway. As part of this project, we have several clinicians across our sites completing training in the Reflective Parenting Program. RPP is typically offered in a group format, and the goals of the curriculum include helping parents improve their reflective capacity and attachment behaviors with their children. These two programs are just two examples of how we are working within the department, across the med center, and with community partners to better serve our youngest patients. I'm very excited to talk with you today about how the biopsychosocial model has helped us develop innovative ways to care for older adults. Excellence in geriatric care is multi and interdisciplinary by necessity. Knowing that there are few geriatric psychiatry services, with the University of Rochester having one of the country's oldest geriatric psychiatry programs and the only fellowship program in upstate New York, we were faced with a dire situation as the silver tsunami of aging baby boomers approached. How were we to care for this quickly expanding cohort of older adults? Our team decided to bring Project ECHO to New York. Project ECHO is a model developed to increase access to specialized expertise, utilizing technology to link an expert hub with practitioners with less expertise with the goal of demonopolizing knowledge. We started with Project ECHO linking our expert hub a geriatric psychiatrist, geriatrician, geriatric nurse practitioner, psychiatric pharmacist, therapist, and a representative from the Alzheimer's Association with primary care physicians throughout New York State. But with our biopsychosocial lens, we realized we could truly serve vulnerable older adults by leveraging our expertise in specific settings, namely nursing homes, and we were very successful. The focus of our Project ECHOES in Geriatric Mental Health, Project ECHO GEM, integrates not only psychiatric medication, often de-prescribing, but also ways to understand the nursing home residents' psychosocial histories, their ways of coping and dealing with stress, and the context in which these events happen. We developed a geriatric telepsychiatry program to complement Project ECHO GEM. The nursing home is often asking us to make medication recommendations for agitative or difficult behaviors. They often think that the goal is to actually add more medications, add different medications, change the medications they're on. But most often what we end up doing is trying to look at the whole picture, reminding them that the nursing home is actually these residents' home. It is not a place that they visit. It is not a place that they just come in and out of and act out for other people to manage them. It's not often a place they want to be. It is their home. And seeing the resident in that kind of context is very helpful for staff and other people who work in nursing home settings to understand why the older adults may be acting in a certain way. Medication is not always the answer. And using our biopsychosocial approach throughout our programs in Project ECHO and Geriatric Telepsychiatry allows us to help people see the whole person in their home and not just as a patient that needs medication. Seeing the whole person in context is the heart of the biopsychosocial model, and it is the essence of excellent geriatric psychiatry care. Well, I want to welcome all the panelists and uh, certainly encourage people to put in questions to the Q&A. But to begin with, um, we have some sort of thematic questions that are sort of 
ready for everyone to discuss. And the first one is what challenges make the populations that you serve unique? How are they, how have you shaped your programs and your services to fit this unique population? Anyone, feel free, well, jump on. I think, I think I'll, I'll speak um, to that question a little bit differently. Um, Dr. Santos so clearly articulated really well the nursing home structure in the nursing home setting. Interestingly enough, you know, we added the nurse engagement specialist. Actually, Dr. Santos may remember that we started that together back in uh, Shorewinds, maybe in the 1990s, added a nurse engagement specialist. And the, really the population that the nurse engagement specialists are focused on are the nursing home staff themselves um, who are working with um, a very vulnerable challenge patient population often feel isolated uh, in the nursing home themselves as nursing staff. And the psychiatric nurses who participate in the interaction with the nursing home staff really focus on decreasing their sense of isolation, increasing their sense of confidence, feeling supported uh, in working with more challenging patients. And there's nothing more challenging than a patient that when the psych consultant comes in, takes them off their medication <laughs> or reduces their medication. That can be frightening for a nursing home staff member. And um, you know, the nurse engagement specialist really focuses on increasing the comfort level, helping them with plans to care for that patient as that goes. So uh, the, that, that's my contribution to that piece. Well, maybe this brings up with Dr. Santos, the education side of Project ECHO, and you can speak a little bit to that and how it is always upskilling or enhancing the skill base of the people you're working with. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, our, our goal is really to educate people uh, in general about how to care for older adults. And I think that um, one of the challenges actually of, of taking care of older adults is really in a word ageism. Um, yeah. People expect that when you get older, you're gonna be de depressed, you're gonna be decrepit, um, and they don't really take into account, you know, we're talking about the biopsychosocial model, that there are still humans, <laughs> there's life changes, uh, there's retirement, there's role transitions, changing households, death, grief, outliving your children. And there's, um, in general, has been a lot of lack of respect for, for aging, no matter what situation you're in. Um, and, you know, I, we're always pointing out that you don't become infantile, even if you do need someone to change your depends, right? It, it doesn't just change your whole life. You have to... Our goal is to maintain dignity and a sense of self-worth, right? Um, in the face of societal ageism, really, in, in every program we have. Project ECHO, uh, you know, focuses on nursing homes um, and helping un people understand how they might view pe older adults, uh, specifically in nursing home settings. But in our other programs, in the memory care program, in the older adult services, um, even when we work with MIPS, like Telva, Telva knows this very well. Uh, we try to help people uh, understand that, you know, when you get older, you don't just become, a, you're not a big child, you know, um, and I think that's one of the reasons I love Rochester, you know, is because we all have programs that are focused on treating people where they are in context, and we just have all different contexts. I, I think it, it, we're, it's fabulous. Well, can others speak to this? We also have, a, obviously, in the substance use world, multiple unique populations. So one of the unique populations uh, that I think of when uh, you pose your question, Eric, is the, um, <clears throat> the people who take drugs and uh, die from drug overdose. That's been a very concrete challenge for us, of course. And that has been constantly getting worse. I started here in 92. We began to see drug overdoses in the mid 90s and they've been going up slowly but steadily ever since. And especially during the pandemic, they've been going up. We're also seeing uh, some novel uh, psychoactive substances uh, and also some uh, synthetic opioids and synthetic stimulants, stimulants as well. And early on, we began to hand out uh, Narcan kits, naloxone kits, uh, as soon as they were available. And I remember going to you at the time and uh, 
asking you if we could hand out Narcan kits because um, they had needles at the time. They had uh, syringes and we used to get people to practice on oranges, uh, injecting an orange with some water. So <laughs> we've come a long way since then and uh, naloxone is now intranasal and we have plenty of it to give to any patient who is uh, at risk for an overdose. But that, uh, that certainly has been a, a huge challenge uh, for us. I think, you know, I would add that in, you know, in addition to the unique challenges that, you know, are posed by, by substance use and, and the emergence of um, synthetic drugs and counterfeit pills, that the co-occurring mental health um, disorders has been increasing in our patient population as well. And I think the way that, you know, we've been able to shape our programs to meet those unique needs really is the theme of integration. So we, you know, we had, you know, program clinic that were, had a narrow focus and really operating separately. And by bringing it together to be able to, to treat the whole person. So we integrated, you know, all substance use services under one umbrella. Then we integrated mental health treatment within our services. Then we integrated being able to respond to the social determinants of health, being able to um, provide some physical health in our program. It truly provides the ability for us to be patient-centered and treat the whole person um, as opposed to, you know, really trying to refer patients all over the place and, and they're having multiple providers, multiple therapists, multiple counselors. We've really built a program that can look at um, assess the needs of our patients and, and really meet it within our program. Uh, you about, uh, go ahead. I, I just want to add on to just the challenge and um, actually the reward of treating people with severe mental illness is really comes from being able to, um, I remember way back when I first met Dr. Boulay and we were in the parking lot, um, just of strong ties, seeing a woman in particular with a non-union fracture of her leg, walking around, not getting care. Um, and he told me that is why we need to build this clinic. And ever since then, we really have built the clinic in the spirit of autonomy uh, and understanding the psychiatric complexity, uh, coupled with the medical comorbidity has allowed us to really help patients uh, meet them where they're at in a safe way while respecting them and give them, them autonomy and decision-making capacity, uh, providing them with really easy to understand uh, risk and benefits um, it, that uh, that really meet their needs where they're at. Also, be mindful of not overwhelming um, them with uh, treatments that are lofty, but that I or we, the team, doesn't feel the patient could ever comply with and um, would become them persona non grata in the other of other specialties and um, maybe even risk the chance that other patients might have benefit from that treatment later on. So it's been a challenging 28 years, but um, certainly I've seen people grow older and share with EJ. I've shared patients with Patrick. I've shared patients uh, with Bob. Um, I haven't shared patients with Kenya yet. <laughs> But it's um, I don't I don't know this group. I look at this group, and there's nothing more biopsychosocial than just looking at what we do and how we continue in the continuum of people's lives. Well, I want to start sort of shifting to the service area as how you shape programs. And I, Steve, I was going to ask you about the notion that there were a number of people who didn't make it to care, who ended up in what we sometimes called the alternate mental health system, which is courts and jails. And what, what it takes for mental health workers to work with law enforcement and the courts um, and how to build a collaborative team 
for the services that don't necessarily fit neatly into what we would call the traditional medical model, which of course, that's why the biopsychosocial model is so important. Absolutely, Eric. You know, one of the things that we have to understand is that um, patient health and public safety are complementary. They're not competing. You know, often we tend to see things in a polarized or black and white way. And the reality is that unless we can combine our mental health and criminal justice system, people are going to fall through the cracks. And when you do bring those forces together, you start seeing some of the things I mentioned in the video, like shared problem solving, therapeutic alternatives to punishment, and so forth. Um, you know, we're kind of still in the get tough on crime era, and we still incarcerate more citizens per capita than any country on earth, including Russia or Rwanda or China. Despite that, there's a large evidence base in what works in preventing criminal justice involvement. And when you combine that database with our community mental health database, we start to see things that are new and promising. And we're hoping that that's what fact will continue to be. Bob, I wanted to pick up on something you said, which was, is that, well, when you came here, there were all sorts of, you know, highly skilled interpreters and people were, as it were, aware that um, we have a, you know, a kind of a robust, robust deaf population. But that wasn't the same thing as having a service that was dedicated to, you know, really being available to people with deafness and their families. And I, what do you think the difference is between those two? Because many medical centers around the country have lots of interpreters, but don't have services. Right, let me begin to answer that by going back to your original question, which was what makes the population that we serve, which is the sign language using deaf population for the most part, unique. Um, and I put that in sort of two categories. There are aspects of this population that are similar to other non-English speaking populations. Okay, it's a different language. Hopefully everybody knows that sign language, American sign language and other countries signed languages are not like the spoken language in those countries. Hopefully everybody knows that. Hopefully everybody knows that, for example, literacy can be a challenge for deaf people just as it is for immigrants or refugees who come to the United States, but for different reasons, of course. But then there's other aspects of the deaf population which are really unique. The first one is family dynamics. 95% of deaf children are born to hearing parents uh, and it is true, unfortunately, that the vast majority of hearing patients don't learn sign language or don't learn it well enough to actually have good interactive conversations or teach sign language to their deaf kids. So family interaction and the passage of information between family members is often extremely limited in our service population. Um, so what I like to call fund of information is a huge issue, whether it's uh, in mental health issues or, or, or legal issues or medical issues, is very, very significant. And I think in some ways much more significant than in other non-English speaking populations. But another particularly unique aspect um, is, what, uh, is what occurs when deaf individuals, who we often serve at the Deaf Wellness Center, grow up with without significant aspect, excuse me, significant um, exposure to sign language early enough or long enough to learn it, and also don't learn a spoken language very well, which is really difficult. So we have this subpopulation of deaf people who have extremely limited language abilities of any kind at all. Mm -hmm. And these people present a unique differential diagnostic problem that does not correlate to diagnostic issues with, let's say, a Spanish-speaking population or some other uh, immigrant, refugee, uh, you know, multi-generational, uh, non-English-speaking population where they'll get language and get information from the family in a vertical way. So we have the subpopulation of deaf people who, who may have language anomalies, yes, possibly for psychiatric reasons, yes, po possibly for neurological reasons, but also this big subpopulation that we often see at the Deaf Wellness Center or in legal situations who just don't know language. And that differential diagnostic problem, is it psychiatric, is it neurological, or is it what I call social origin language disfluency? 
that differential diagnostic problem doesn't show up with hearing people. Um, so, so, so that's my answer to what's unique about our population. As far as your question about interpreter services, interpreters are fabulous. We're, they're, they're practice professionals, just like doctors and, and teachers and police officers, but they often are not in a situation where they can sufficiently provide guidance uh, to the individuals who, with whom they are working. And uh, they'll do their best to bridge fund of information gaps, language gaps, et cetera. But unless they're provided with sufficient uh, opportunity to, to confer with clinicians, which often they are not, sometimes be, often because of clinicians' attitudes that you're just here to translate. What comes out of my mouth, you translate and that's it which is really inappropriate. And so because of that dynamic, the importance of the Deaf Wellness Center and having deaf clinicians, sign fluent clinicians, deaf trainees, et cetera, really makes a, a, a particular contribution uh, above and beyond what our wonderful staff of interpreters are given the latitude to do. Can you hear? Can you hear? I'm getting some feedback here. Uh, Kenya, your um, cl clinical service is perhaps the youngest of all the clinical services that we have here, not only in terms of the population you are addressing, but also literally how long it's existed. And I wonder what kinds of challenges has it been, you know, that you've had to deal with in actually creating this kind of, of innovative service? Well, one thing that comes to mind is that all of the things that we're talking about that are struggles for working with older folks or average age folks, I don't even know what average age is, average age folks who have concerns, um, we have to know about those too um, because those people have children and they bring their children into us. And so really the biopsychosocial um, um, approach really comes in very early because we understand that all of the things that the family is struggling with are increasing the risks of developing difficult lots of things um, for their young children. So we, our child and adolescent services serve zero to 21. Um, and so even just listening um, to Bob talk about some of these things with, um, you know, those deaf children who are growing up with hearing parents who haven't learned sign language or who have been told by their pediatricians not to learn sign language because that, that doesn't support them to use spoken language. Um, those are things that we as the intake or assessment person need to understand how that has a long-term impact on those children that are coming in. Um, so I think I don't think that that's necessarily um, unique because I think in listening to everyone talk, we're all thinking about family and family risk and family interventions. And I think Rochester, especially the U of R, we are so resource rich. So when we have families who come in for a two-year-old and mom is really struggling with a substance use disorder or dad is um, seriously mental, mentally ill or things like that, we have um, services that we can at least talk about, talk about well, connect with each other about, make referrals for. Bob, what do you got for me? You know, those kinds of um, situations can happen. Um, and I, But I do think that because we are serving the youngest kids um, and we have that in a different way, that delicate balance because children can't decide for themselves. So we have to hold the baby in mind and also hold the family in mind and convince the family of the things that we're recommending and understand the long-term implications of why we're recommending them in ways that make sense for everyone, which might be teachers, which might be pediatricians, which might be the nurses, because um, we do a lot of consultation where kids are um, as opposed to just bringing them into the clinic. So I don't know if that answered your question or not. Well, it addresses it and there's really no right answer to these things. But one of the things that, that uh, George wrote about in a really interesting paper in 1982 was in the New England Journal of Medicine. And he was talking about training future clinicians in the biopsychosocial model. Now, he was um, dinging psychiatrists. I, I hesitate to say it, but it's true. He was criticizing psychiatrists, at, at, especially at the time when they were being solely psychological in some ways and arguing that they needed to be integrated. 
And, uh, but also that they, that, you know, that he was also criticizing some psychiatrists who wanted to just all be the medical model and, you know, we'll just be part of medicine and we'll be all biological. And uh, he was, he was arguing that it needed to be uh, this integrated kind of thing. So what does it take for your, for you and your clinicians to work in these settings, which require breadth and flexibility as well as depth? It isn't a question of being thin spread as a veneer, but knowing how to identify what families need, what two-year-olds need, what 72-year-olds need, what um, someone who's coming in with mixed substance use or who's had multiple arrests, or in fact, as Roger Boulay discovered in his first days in setting up MIPS, you know, he would come to me and say, I found a case of, and then you could name any of the number of significant you know, medical problems that were going on and that he was intervening with that would have killed people had they not had his care. And we often would talk about this. Um, what's it take to work in these settings? I, I want to say something about Lazos that it mirrors what Bob kind of said and what Kenya kind of said and what EJ kind of said. And it's really about this language. Um, we all speak our patient's language. And training is really about teaching learners that language. But we don't really, we learn it and we mentor each other with it. But I think we learn it from the patients initially, right? And it's what Bob said. I, uh, in my Spanish clinic, I take off more medications because at some point, some interpreter has said that somebody has auditory hallucination and not put it in the context of somebody's whole life their psychosocial being, their poverty, the social determinants of health that in and of itself drives to feeling depressed and not well, um, not necessarily treatable by an antidepressant, um, maybe treatable by money, but, uh, it, but not always treatable by an antidepressant. And it's a different type of um, language that we speak in all these clinics. I think that part of the training is not just book training, but I think it's to teach uh, learners how to take these jewels that people like Bob and Gloria and EJ have and really put it together into this very complex human being that is not just a biological human being or a psychological, but a very complex uh, biologic, biopsychosocial person that's part of a home and it's part of a family, which further complicates the whole uh, paradigm more. Uh, so I think it's about us learning how to speak. I sometimes tease and I say, I speak schizophrenia. That's why I could work at MIPS, but that's because I know I feel, I sense, I smell, I know where they live. I know what they will say. And it's just such a part of who I am and how I feel that that's what you try to teach your learners um, is to be in that space. I think, please go ahead. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, I was gonna say real quick, I think we're, we're able to do it effectively to me is because of the team-based care, having a multidisciplinary team. And so we treat our patients as teams. So when, when Gloria is treating a patient, she's talking to the case manager She's talking to the primary counselor that is responsible for developing the treatment plan for that patient. She's talking to the nurse. She's talking to now our peer specialists who are working directly with our patients in the community and connecting them to recovery services. So I think it's that team-based care that allows us to do it. And furthermore, we incorporate that team into the education and training process. So when we have residents or fellows in our under our roof you know they're they're observing counselors facilitate a group therapy session so they're not only observing the physician working with the patient they're getting the full picture and they're getting that full biopsychosocial picture of the care we provide to patients so one of the implications of this of course is is that the um how shall I say, the old model, which was, was, was also quite gendered in that it was mostly men, was that it isn't always that the physician is king and that, that 
clearly in a multidisciplinary world, it is the skills and qualities and sensibilities of diverse groups of people and the leadership of diverse groups of people that can bring to bear on, um, how should I say, they're all stronger together than they are apart. Well, I think what comes to mind is is the um, when you say when you said that was that relationship is king. You know, I think of that parallel to the relationships that we have with our patients, but also the relationships we have with our teammates. You know, and that we can trust each other, um, that we understand what our roles are, what our roles aren't. Nobody has to know everything because everybody knows something. And we can lean on each other, consult with each other for the, and hold what the patient needs in mind in order to do that well, and also include and collaborate well with the, with the family. And I think that one of the things that comes up, you know, as we're all talking is developing these ways to engage our patients in their care as a partner, as opposed to handing them a package of care that didn't really fit what they were looking for, what they needed, where they were, what they could do. And I think that's really the, um, the hallmark of, of what we do now. Right, and I think I'm gonna transition to some questions that have come in and I certainly encourage others to submit them if you haven't. But this gets at the fundamental issue of shaping services to meet the needs of patients, families, and communities, as opposed to telling the patients to fit what we offer. And all too often in the past and over many generations, it was you come to the physician's office, there's a social understanding of a power relationship with the physician having that power. And in that context, then, you know, you take what I give you as it were, as opposed to we bring together diverse sets of skills and sensibilities to figure out what you need in a very comprehensive way, appreciating not only what's going on with you and your family, but the community from which you've come from and the culture which underlies it. Well, we have, we have a couple of questions. The first one is, is psychiatry as a profession is increasingly focused on brain processes and chemical treatment modes and research funding sources have been more directed those areas of study. Um, is there a possibility or even a risk that the biopsychosocial model will be neglected during the years ahead? So I, I don't think so at all, Eric. In fact, quite the opposite. I think the biopsychosocial model will be expanded uh, with our in, increasing understanding of neurologic and uh, neurophysiological mechanisms and so forth. So uh, a good example is uh, patients who are currently in our methadone program. And by the way, next year we are reaching uh, the 50th anniversary of our methadone program, which began in uh, 1973. So um, these people, even though methadone is life-saving for them, they still need to work on other stuff, a lot of other stuff. They still have families, they have depression, they have medical illnesses, etc. cetera. And uh, we can use everything and bring it to bear upon the one patient, whether it's biological or psychosocial. And I think I would say we are also at the forefront of, of research and education um, with uh, the biopsychosocial model in, in geriatrics with Dr. Kim Van Organ's work and Dr. Kathy Hefner with social connectedness. I mean, that's what it's all about, right? Um, we, not all of our programs, uh, actually all the programs that we've talked about right now, um, are focused not only on the, the identified patients, but also their caregivers, right? All the system, the adult children, the spouses, the friends, the, the aides that take care of them, the people going their homes with fact, you know, all of us, it, it's not just about the medication. Um, we, have, we have changed the paradigm and I think we are just gonna keep going. And um, I don't think we're gonna lose the biopsychosocial model at all. Well, I, wanna I think we're, we're leading the way. Yeah, underscore a couple of things. One, of course, is that people you named were not psychiatrists and the question came from someone who's not a psychiatrist. But the other thing is, is that these programs that have been set up require multidisciplinary skills, require a breadth of vision. And if there's anything that's clear is, is that um, even if you had a magical medicine that could make all the hallucinations and delusions go away in a person suffering from schizophrenia, they still have to live a life. And if they've lived a life which in fact has put them in a very adverse situation, then they need to learn new skills. And that is really part of what we do. And certainly Bob's talked about this and 
we see this in the programs that are being set up across the across this group of people. A second question, and uh, is if George Engel were alive right now, and he'd be a rather old fellow. Um, what do you think he would say are aspects of, of biopsychosocial care, education, and research that might be missing in our department? Where where might we be coming up short? What are we not doing that we might do better? I I would just add also that there might be another. Um, uh, domain, biopsychosocial. Some people talk about the spiritual, right? And what what that role has in people's connectedness and people's well-being as well. And uh, while not all patients are spiritual, there are those that are, and that that for them is a strength that also needs to be leveraged in their care um, in in a thoughtful way. Um, I I do think that the biopsychosocial uh, model would have disappeared and extinguished if we had continued uh, the diet of the patient doctor relationship. People in life are so complex that without the multidisciplinary teams, we would not be able to take care of these patients outside of an institution, which is the only place I can think of, even though it's not even present now, where you could actually in those days when patients would stay 30 days, where you could actually dedicate your time to that patient doctor relationship in a safe uh, space. Um, but they, it, was, it never wandered outside of that space to figure out what happened, right? We do not work in that space. We work, most of us work outside of that inpatient unit. Um, so we have to uh, you leverage resources from multiple disciplines in order to figure out how to best deliver this biopsychosocial model. Um, and so we live in their lives, and I don't think it'll ever go away because. Right. This and is I want to. Yeah, I want to add that, that that the and this goes to the question. I think in some ways what we've been saying tonight is how was the biopsychosocial model when it was originally conceived not considering the multiplicity and diversity of populations that we're working with now, not going out into the communities and engaging the communities that we were, that we engage now. And indeed, one of the things that we're doing, and we've been doing, I think, in the department for a number of years and continue to do in a growing and vibrant way, is looking really beyond what was originally, you know, scripted and saying, how can we expand the biopsychosocial model and make it a vibrant, dynamic tool, because it's an intellectual tool, for the 21st century and add on to what it was in the 20th century. And so I know from knowing George that he didn't think about social processes the way we think about social processes. He didn't think about diversity the way we do, or you know, what zip code are you born in, or what, you know, what are the cultural disadvantages and disparities that you were faced with, although he might explore some of those with individuals. And so I think there's a number of ways in which we've grown it larger, and I mean collectively all of us. Um, final question, and we only have a few more minutes or maybe two minutes is, has the increased use of telehealth improved mental health care and outcomes? And that's a general question. EJ, you might you know walk up to that with with echo and, uh, but there, you know, certainly a number of, uh, how should I say, COVID was a deep dive quickly into telehealth. Uh, but EJ, do you wanna kick that off? Uh, sure. I mean, I think we have been using telehealth for, oh my gosh, eight years? 2012, 2012, 2013, right? We, right. we, we dipped our toes in the water with uh, telepsychiatry and Project Echo and, um, we were lucky because we had this uh, resource in our department and we were able to, you know, when COVID shut the world down two years ago, within a week, we got everybody up and running. And I think all of us have benefited. Um, at least we were able to, to make some outreach to people. Uh, there are, we all have barriers. I'm sure we could talk for another two hours or a day about all the barriers with who has access. You know, my, a lot of my older adults don't, don't know how to use the phone if they have one. Um, but I do think for the people that can access telehealth, 
it really has helped keep them connected in a way that I know we have patients that are doing so much better, even if they can't get outside their house. It's great. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll just say as we wrap up now, because I think our time is coming to an end, that, that the department had a tremendous amount of talent in place and made a transition to telehealth like no other in the medical center and few in the country with a rapidity that was really preserving of people's health as well as promoting of people's health. It was a life preserver. And I mean that quite literally for some people. And uh, while it's not been easy to measure, COVID has been a, you know, a, a how should I say, a chaotic, frenetic time, um, it certainly made a tremendous difference. And well, I wanna thank all of you for participating tonight and thank uh, you know, all of you who stayed on online with us you know, and, and uh, participated in, you know, as, as uh, audience for this discussion. And you know, point out that our next seminar, our next webinar rather is gonna be on Tuesday, April 26th and it's Biopsychosocial Innovations in Research. Tuesday, April 26th for a continuation of the 75th anniversary series. So thank you very much, uh, it's 7.15, and I guess it's time to close up shop and head on for the evening.